All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, a couple of things before we get started. Uh, one is that I have put up the first uh, homework assignment. Actually, um, if you've seen the homework assignment on the Blackboard page already, it's in the homework link. Um, this learning system that we're using this year is called Learn Smart. Uh, and it's not just like a, a sort of standard homework assignment where you just get questions and you answer them. It actually is an adaptive learning system. So uh, what it will do first on each question is ask you what your confidence level is in, the, in how you think you'll answer it. And so it's trying to learn what, how you think about those problems. And so you'll have to answer that first, how confident you are. And be honest with that. If you, think, if you see the question and, and think that you, there's no way you could answer it, uh, click that button. Um, if you know it, um, if you think you know it for sure, put that confidence level on there. Um, and then what it does is it'll adapt to what you know and what you think you know, um, which is a nice thing. So it will lead you through various questions, and it's set up uh, on average, to, which should take about 40 minutes to go through the first module. Um, that's an average, so it could take longer or faster depending on the individual. Um, but if it thinks that you're not getting some concept uh, that's important for some of the questions in there, it should lead you back and, and take you through additional resources so that you can learn it. And that's the whole idea of that adaptive learning system. It's the first time I'm using it, and I think it's uh, only been rolled out for organic chemistry since last fall. So it's, it's pretty new at McGraw-Hill, too. So um, we're kind of testing it out. So see if you can get uh, through that. And I'd appreciate any feedback on it and how you think that LearnSmart system works. Um, so please let me know what you think of it, how it's working, um, and if, especially if you have any problems with it. Um, the other thing is I know that the, um, the audio quality of the recorded lectures, if you've been watching the recorded lectures, isn't very good. So I'm trying out a Bluetooth uh, microphone. Hopefully it will uh, get a better consistent quality. So I'm not um, talking on the phone here. I'm actually recording to my computer. Uh, so we'll see how that works too. Okay, um, I want to continue on with this, uh, the overview of the topics in Chapter 1. Uh, if you recall from last time, uh, we talked about uh, various aspects of structure and uh, atomic structure and um, uh, molecular structure. So recall that uh, we have electrons, protons, and neutrons, and they're organized in a structural way um, within discrete energy levels, and in particular within um, regions of space, the electrons are uh, associated in various orbitals that have um, regions of space where we have the highest probability of finding those electrons. Okay. Uh, we're concerned mostly with the S orbitals and the P orbitals in organic chemistry because much of the uh, chemistry we're talking about are elements on that uh, second row of the periodic table. So we don't really delve into D orbitals and, and especially not F orbitals. Um, so recall that. Uh, we talked about bonding. So we have ionic bonds, which are um, atoms which are ionized and held together by electrostatic attractions. And those can organize in all kinds of ways. Uh, for example, uh, sodium chloride packs into this nice cubic crystal structure. So if you see sodium chloride up close, it looks like very uh, uh, well-defined cubes. Um, and you can actually grow large crystals of it that are solid cubes. It's kind of neat. Uh, we talked about covalent bonds, where electrons are shared between more than one atom. Uh, so for example, um, carbon tetrafluoride has uh, uh, bonds between carbon and fluorine, which are shared. There's two electrons in each of those lines. That's how we represent it. And particularly with carbons and some of the other atoms elements, we can have more than one bond between them. So uh, a double bond is actually sharing four electrons between them, and uh, triple bond is sharing six electrons. And this is very important structurally when we talk about organic molecules. Um, and also, one of the most important aspects for chemical reactivity, which will come up over and over and over again this, this semester, is the concept of polarized bonds. Okay, So when you have atoms connected that have different electronegativities, that covalent bond or those shared electrons are not shared equally. And that can span a whole spectrum of uh, polarity in that bond, depending on the difference in electronegativity, all the way from completely non-polarized bonds to, uh, if you get to the extreme, of course, then one atom has taken the electron away and you've ionized. 
All right? And this concept will come up again and again throughout the semester. So I want to continue now uh, talking a little bit about how we uh, think about structure, how we represent structures, and importantly, when we think about chemical reactions, we're thinking a lot about where electrons are and, and where they're moving to. Um, so it is important to look at the, how we represent charges in molecules and uh, how our, the way we represent molecules is inadequate to describe some of the aspects of the molecule as, as well. So we have this idea of formal charge, and that is when, we, when you think about the structures of molecules and you put them together, right? We have the Lewis structure of a molecule. You can draw all the electrons in sort of a static picture and where it belongs on a molecule and to which atom. But uh, sometimes uh, um, atoms in a molecule are not neutral, okay? They have more electrons or, quote, more electron ownership or less electron ownership than uh, they should. Um, and we know something about the valency, right? So if you look at the first row of the, the second row of the periodic table, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, we know how many bonds they make or how many bonds we want to make in order to satisfy the octet rule, right? Carbon is deficient four electrons to fill that um, outer valence shell, so it makes four bonds because it can share four electrons with four bonds, four additional electrons. Nitrogen starts with five valence electrons and it needs three more, so nitrogen is trivalent. It can form three bonds in the neutral state. Uh, oxygen, two bonds. Fluorine, one bond. Hydrogen, one bond. And those uh, valencies you should have um, right at the forefront of your mind all the time thinking about it. So when atoms have more or less than the number of bonds their valency requires to fill that shell, that means uh, formally, they have um, charges that are not zero, okay? And we have to be able to keep track of that. So a formal charge is a way of, of tracking those electrons and who owns them, in, in a sense. And it's, it's quite a simple um, formula to calculate that. Formal charge is the number of valence electrons for that atom that you would start with, minus the number of bonds to that atom. And I think your book describes that as half the number of shared electrons. I think it's much easier just to remember the number of covalent bonds. And then minus the number of any non-bonded electrons. So this shouldn't be uh, new to you. Let's take the example of nitric acid, right? There's a lot of different atoms in here, three oxygens, a nitrogen, and a hydrogen. And uh, using this formula, uh, we should be able to pick out the, uh, calculate the formal charge for all of these atoms. So if you think about the hydrogen, right? Let's just look at the hydrogen. Hydrogen has how many valence electrons? One. And how many bonds does it have? One. So subtract one. And how many non-bonding electrons? Zero. Okay, this one's the easy one. So it has a charge of zero. Pretty obvious, right? Well, how about this oxygen here? Correct. Oxygen starts out with six valence electrons. Uh, that oxygen has how many bonds to it? Two bonds. And how many non-bonding electrons? Four. See, this is easy, right? So overall, that adds up to zero. So that oxygen is also neutral. There's no charge on it. Uh, likewise, this oxygen here, six valence electrons. Two bonds to it. That double bond counts as two bonds, right? Two bonds and four non-bonding electrons. You add that, you take that, the sum of that, subtract those out, you get zero. Uh, but there are a couple of atoms in here which do have formal charges. And hopefully, as you work more with this, it, it should become automatically, you look at that structure, well, there should be a plus charge there and a minus charge there. Let's take a look at that. So this oxygen right here. Uh, if we calculate the formal charge, oxygen starts out with six valence electrons, right? And how many bonds does this one have? Only one covalent bond to it. And it has six non-bonding electrons. So if you add this up, this all equals minus one. 
right there we have an atom which has less bonds than it should based on its valency um, and overall has extra electron ownership. And so this has a negative charge on it. And we represent that by just writing a negative charge by that atom. Uh, when we get more into this class, you'll see I probably won't draw all these lone pairs because it's tedious to do. I'll just write the negative charge. You should know that there are, there are three lone pairs on there. Okay, and finally the nitrogen. If you think about the nitrogen here, nitrogen, normal valency has three bonds. This one now has four to it. So obviously it can't be neutral. So what is the charge? Well, nitrogen starts out with five valence electrons. It has four bonds. And there are no non-bonding electrons here because there is no room. There's, it has eight electrons around it already. So that equals plus one. So the nitrogen has a positive formal charge. And so we would represent it like that. Okay. Uh, anybody have any uh, problems with formal charges and understanding this concept? It is critical that you get this because we come up to it over and over and over again. Here's a couple more examples just to show you so, a little bit about this first row of the periodic table uh, with these elements on it. Um, NH4. Again, we have a nitrogen whose normal valency is three and it has four bonds. So if you do the formal charge just as we did, five valence electrons minus four bonds minus zero non-bonding electrons is plus one. Hopefully this will become automatic. You see nitrogen with four bonds, you know that it's an ammonium ion. It has a plus charge on that nitrogen. Okay, it has to be a cation. Okay, the other example here is um, uh, boron tetrafluoride. That's an interesting one. Um, boron has a valency of three, okay, three not three valence electrons, uh, and normally forms three bonds to be neutral, okay. Uh, but now we have four bonds, so we have four bonds to it, and no non-bonding electrons on the boron. Overall, it has a minus one charge. So depending on where, which column you are in the periodic table, this is an example when you go to the left of carbon on the periodic table. Now uh, the extra bond actually makes it negative, not positive. Okay, so the formal charge here is, is negative. This is actually what we would refer to as a borate compound. Tetrafluoroborate is the name of that anion. Um, borate from the inorganic naming system to indicate negatively charged species. Uh, so although if they look similar in terms of an atom with four bonds to it. Clearly the charges are different because they started out with a different number of electrons as the element. Okay? So be careful about that. Okay, if formal charges should become automatic, uh, as I said, and hopefully uh, uh, you'll be able to see them um, right away when you see molecules that don't have the right number of bonds. Okay, let's take a look at some of the structural formulas for organic molecules. Um, since particularly carbon can have four different bonds to it, um, and other atoms can also have more than one bond to it, like oxygen has two bonds, nitrogen has three, you can think about connecting those atoms in a lot of different ways. Uh, even if you have the same number and kind of atoms, you could connect them in different ways and have different kinds of different molecules. So uh, one of the things that we're concerned with in organic chemistry is this, this uh, concept of isomers. We see all kinds of different isomers. Isomers are simply uh, different molecules that have the same number and kind of atoms. Okay? There are different types of isomers. We're going to talk about uh, constitutional or structural isomers right now, um, which are molecules which differ in just the way the atoms are connected, the order of connectivity, or the constitution of the molecule. Okay, and if we just write the molecular formula, the atoms and the number of atoms, we don't really know anything about how they're connected. And this is why we draw out these Lewis or Kekulé structures, so we know how the atoms 
are interacting with each other within a molecule. So if you, if you think, for example, something that has a molecular formula of C2H6O, right? How many different ways could you draw that? There are more than one isomer available for this molecular formula. So for example, you could, you could think about the carbon connectivity here. Carbon connected to a carbon, which is then connected to an oxygen, and then all the other positions connected with hydrogen. That's one possible way to do this. Okay? But that's not the only isomer possible by connecting those particular atoms together. Another way to connect those atoms together is this way. Okay, the difference here is that the carbons aren't connected to each other uh, like they are here, but they're, they're bridged by the oxygen. The oxygen isn't out on the end, it's between the carbons. Clearly these are different molecules, right? Different molecules will have different molecular properties, uh, different functional group. Here we have an OH group, which is gonna have different chemical properties than the oxygen bound to two carbons. Uh, the carbon skeleton is different, all right? So different molecules, these are isomers, but they have exactly the same number and kind of atoms, all right? So this is a constitutional or a structural isomer. Here's another formula, C3H7Cl. How many different isomers can you draw for this? Okay, think about the atoms and their valency, actually, for, for a second. If you think about this, carbon, carbon has the ability to form four bonds to it, all right? Hydrogen has the ability to form one bond to it. And chlorine has the ability to form one bond to it. So that's something to keep in mind as you think about how to draw these structures out. Um, one way to just start doing this is to draw uh, organic molecules just draw the carbon skeleton. Um, if you have atoms which can only form one bond, obviously they can't be in between two other atoms. So in this case, the only things that can be connected in a row uh, in between two others is the carbon. The chlorine can't be in between two other atoms. The hydrogens can't be in between two other atoms. So in this case, you can draw the carbon skeleton here are four bonds to each of those carbons, right? And we can put the other things on there. So there's seven hydrogens and one chlorine. There's eight positions around this three carbon chain. You could put that chlorine on the first carbon. I'll just put a square around it to show you. Okay, the rest of these would be filled uh, with the seven hydrogens. Okay, there's one isomer. Is there a different way you could connect this molecule? Huh? You can put chlorine on the middle carbon, exactly. I'm not gonna bother drawing all the hydrogens because it's tedious and I'm lazy, but I can show you that the chlorine is on that middle carbon. It's a different molecule, a different isomer. Matter of fact, uh, we, we would um, name this molecule based on the position of the chlorine, uh, we'll learn this in the next chapter, the three carbon group is called propane, and we number the, the chain like this. This is one chloropropane, and this happens to be two chloropropane. The name is very similar because the structure is very similar except the position of the chlorine, but they are constitutional isomers. Okay, uh, are there any other isomers possible? Some say no. I know some people are thinking, well, what happens if you put the chlorine on the number three carbon? <laughs> exactly. Uh, a lot of students I see, especially if you've had this class for the first time and you haven't dealt with these structures a lot, this is exactly the same structure as this. All it's done has been flipped over. We just, it's just if you're numbering it, number one from this side, one, two, three. It's on the end of the chain. So that's exactly the same thing. Okay, so uh, be careful about that. How you draw it on the paper doesn't mean it's stuck there, right? It's a molecule. You can view it from many different angles. So view, just view it in different angles, that's the same thing. Uh, 
That, well, no, because all three of these positions are the same. They're all on the one carbon. Yeah. And as we get more into looking at the three-dimensional structures, you'll see that. Good question. Uh, did everyone hear that question? Would it be different if I put this chlorine here or here? The answer is no. Here's another example, um, CH3NO2. How many structural isomers could you draw for this? Well, let's take a look at this. Uh, CH3NO2, right? Think about the valency. Uh, the CH3 group, right, the carbon has a valency of four, hydrogen's one, nitrogen, three bonds, and oxygen, two bonds. So those, um, those oxygens and nitrogens, they can be in between other atoms. So there's a, there's a few more possibilities here for this structure. Let's take a look at this. So carbon, you could draw it like this. Uh, is that big enough? That could be attached to, let's say, to the nitrogen. Nitrogen has three bonds. So we could attach it like that. Now, does that encompass all the atoms? That's all the atoms. But something's not happy here, right? Oxygen needs two bonds. Or the overall, the molecule has to be neutral. Actually, in, in this case, if you, if you take all the valence electrons and take the time to count them up and put them all in, the way to write this molecule is like this where one oxygen has three lone pairs, one oxygen has a double bond and, and two lone pairs. So this has some formal charges on it, okay? This oxygen is similar to that nitric acid structure, right? So this oxygen has a minus charge, and this nitrogen has a formal plus charge because it has four bonds to it, okay? Can you think of another way to draw uh, uh, these atoms in a different connection? Here's a possibility. Instead of connecting the carbon to a nitrogen, connect it to an oxygen. Okay? Then you can connect it to the nitrogen, and then you can have another double bond. Here, all the atoms are neutral. There's no formal charge. Every atom has an octet. That's a valid uh, structure for that molecule. Okay, and it's a different isomer. Very obviously different. The nitrogen and oxygen connections to the carbons are different. Uh, what else could you draw? Anything else? Now, I'm a little bit biased as an as a organic chemist because uh, uh, knowing how to draw condensed formulas, I always associate CH3 as a carbon with three hydrogens as a, what we call a methyl group. And so that's what I start with, always, CH3. But if this is truly just a molecular formula, those hydrogens could be anywhere. They don't have to just be on carbon. So there are a number of other isomers you could draw that are structural isomers. For example, uh, we could put an OH there. Let's see. That would, uh, that would fit, that would work. That's a possibility, okay? Uh, you could do something like, this. That fits that molecular formula, um, and so on. There's actually a few more things like this you could draw that are um, perfectly valid Lewis structures for this molecular formula, okay? So obviously you see the more, uh, the, the more atoms and the more types of atoms that have more than one possible bond to it, the more possibilities there are for different isomers to exist, right? I said on the first day that organic chemicals can have uh, literally an infinite number of possible combinations, and a lot due to this type of idea that they are isomers. Are all the, ah, not all of these molecules are stable. 
uh, this would not be stable, for example. So I, I, we didn't talk about whether these molecules exist, but they're valid Lewis structures. Huh? Everything obeys the octet rule. I might not have drawn all the lone pairs. So which one? The one on the top? This one. Yes, this obeys the octet rules. And actually, this is a stable molecule. If you fill in all the elect lone pairs, like I said, organic chemists tend not to draw them. You should know there's, in the neutral state, there's two lone pairs, one lone pair, and two lone pairs. Everything has an octet. All right. Any other questions on these examples? Uh, boy, I didn't draw them all out. So I don't know how many isomers there are. There's a few more I know, I can think. But um, some of them are certainly not going to be stable molecules. So. I don't know. You should do as an exercise, draw all the possibilities and make sure they have valid Lewis structures. You you mean to know for this this formula? No. What you need to know is any formula I give you, could you draw the possible isomers? And I wouldn't give you something that would have a thousand different isomers, so you wouldn't worry about that. But you should know the rules. And like I said on the first day, learn the concepts, not memorize specific examples. Learn the concept of uh, Lewis structure, valency, and then um, what are valid structures that you could connect together. All right? Okay. Um, there's another aspect to how we represent formulas, and actually it's an inadequacy of our idea of Lewis structures. That is, we're drawing a specific uh, molecule with specific electron ownership. Um, but there are cases where uh, the actual structure can't be adequately represented by a Lewis structure. Okay, and, and when we have this situation, what we can do is we can draw Lewis structure extremes, which are sort of the, the extremes of what actual molecule exists somewhere in between that. Okay, or as a sum of those different Lewis structures. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's a concept which we call resonance. That is, electrons in certain situations can be spread out, not in a, in a, in a lone pair, and that lone pair is just sitting there localized. They could be delocalized over more than one atom. Okay, and it's hard to represent that with the Lewis structure. Let's take, for example, this molecule, ozone. Okay, ozone is O3, oxygen uh, is divalent or has some, um, starts with six valent electrons. So if you have a molecule O3, how many electrons do we have available for bonding and, non, and lone pair? Three times six is 18, right? So somehow I have to include 18 electrons in this three oxygen molecule, right? That could be a combination of covalent bonds, single or double bonds, or triple bonds perhaps, or lone pairs. So how would we draw that? Um, in this case, we could think about, say, drawing uh, something like this. Okay. We know oxygen needs, uh, well, what would be wrong with this? Oxygen is looking for two bonds. Yeah, this oxygen in the middle has four bonds. But, I mean, it's okay to have more than the number of bonds for valence, but there has to be a formal charge with that. One extra bond would make the oxygen plus charge. Two extra bonds would make the oxygen with a two plus charge. And we don't usually see atoms. Atoms in a molecule have more than one charge, a plus or a minus. So that one probably isn't worthwhile. But we can start with one. Uh, and put a lone pair on there, and we can put, this one has two bonds, so we'll put the other two lone pairs. So this one has an octet, okay, this one has an octet. Uh, this one, in order to have an octet, would have three lone pairs. Now, did I get the right number of electrons? How many electrons total? In the covalent bonds, there are two, four, six, and then lone pairs, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. That's all our valence electrons. That's a perfectly valid.
valid structure. However, I'm missing some things. If you calculate the formal charges, the oxygen on the left will be zero. The oxygen in the middle will be, will be plus charge. And the oxygen on the right will be negatively charged. Okay. It's a neutral molecule, so overall, your formal charges have to cancel each other out. All right? Uh, the formal charge. So six valence electrons minus three bonds minus two electrons would be plus one. Uh, and the same thing here. Six valence electrons minus one bond minus six lone pair electrons. That would be minus one. Okay, well, that's one way to write it. But another way to write it, let's say these are fixed in space, I could have put this the other way. I could have drawn the double bond on this side and put the negative charge on this side. Okay, that's another way to draw that. Okay, so if I had uh, a way to label oxygen one, oxygen two, oxygen three, um, then what this says is that there is a way to write the molecule where all the negative charges here or all the negative charges here. In actuality, if you calculate where plus and minus charge in this molecule, the actual molecule looks something like this, where we have a plus charge on the middle and we have a half of a negative charge on this oxygen and a half of a negative charge on this oxygen. Okay? But that doesn't make a lot of sense according to how we draw Lewis structures and count octet rules. And that's the problem. The Lewis structure representation, this one, doesn't adequately describe the actual molecule property. property. Okay? So in that in essence what's happening is this negative charge is being equally split between the two end oxygen. That's where the electron density is on the molecule at, at both of the oxygens, not just one. And this, so these structures actually don't exist. They're not isomers. We don't call this an isomer. These are what we refer to as resonance forms. Resonance is kind of a, a poor name in my mind because it means that they are moved, switching back and forth. And actually, these are not switching back and forth. The electron density is just spread out in this, in this way. Although we represent it as if we are thinking about them as switching back and forth. So the, when we have resonance structures, uh, this is only a delocalization of electrons. We haven't moved any atom connectivity. Okay? We haven't broken any bonding between the atoms except a pi bond, what we refer to as a pi bond, a double bond or potentially a triple bond. So we've shifted electrons around in our representations of the extreme uh, from having a lone pair here to forming a double bond and then keeping these electrons out. Notice none of the atoms octet has changed in these resonance forms. Okay, and we often show those electron movements uh, like this, for example. So to go from the left structure to the right structure, I might just draw these electrons flowing down to form the double bond, and that would that would then put too many electrons around that center oxygen. So I would have to break something, and I break this pi bond or this double bond and shift them up, and vice versa. Okay, makes sense. So again, I want to reiterate. I want to reiterate the molecule itself has more than one part of Lewis structure where we've only shifted around electrons. We haven't shifted atoms. All right. And the actual structure is neither of these, but a sum of all of them put together with that electron density distributed or delocalized. All right. It's, it's kind of a concept that is difficult to grasp. Uh, and, and take a lot of and take a lot of practice on seeing them. So again, individual residence forms don't exist. They represent Lewis structure extremes that are inadequately representing the molecule. The actual species is a hybrid of all those forms, or a sum, summation of all those residence forms. They change or differ only in the distribution of pi or non-bonding electrons. The atoms aren't moved. They're not disconnected and connected differently. Uh, if you think about different 
separate, but it's going to form a certain structure for a molecule. A molecule. Um, all of the, um, if it's going to be a valid specimen form, it has to obey normal valency rules. That is, that is, you can't exceed eight electrons around it. Electrons around it. Okay, you can't violate the octet rule in that regard. In that regard. Um, and the actual structure, or the actual hybrid of all the resonant forms, is um, a lower energy structure than the individual resonant form themselves. Okay, and there's lots of different types of, different types of resonance uh, uh, molecules. So uh, if we go back to nitric acid, nitric acid remember we used this example, example to calculate the, the formal charge, the formal charge, which if you recall has a negative charge on the oxygen and a plus charge and a plus charge on the nitrogen. On the nitrogen. Everything has an octet. Uh, but I can draw a resonance for this molecule, which looks like this. So if you think so about how to go from one resonance form, form to another, again, in vision, in vision, lone pairs being adjacent to multiple bonds, to like a double bond, and then you can just shift the electron. You, electron. Shift the you electron. can't do that to break a single bond, bond, a single bond, but if you form a bond, you take one electron down to form a second bond, you have to break that bond. You have to push those electrons up, those on to the other oxygen. And if you do that and draw the other extreme of this resonance form, you would get that. You would get that. Oops, can you see that other electron there? See that other electron there? Oh, no, I'm messing it up. That's the easiest thing to draw. That's the easiest thing to draw. So notice, um, so notice there are two resonance forms I can draw from this. I can draw from this. Uh, and the actual uh, structure is neither of these. The actual structure, structure is a combination of these combinations. So the actual structure, the actual structure for this molecule for this molecule. Uh, uh, looks like this. Where we have a half of a negative charge there, a half of a negative charge there, and a negative charge there, and a negative charge there, and a plus charge there. Okay? If equal the electrons are equally distributed among both of those oxygens, that negative charge. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Now, can anyone see another resonance structure? Another resonance structure possible here? Huh? Huh? No, for this molecule. No, for this molecule. Let me clear this up. Everybody have to clear that up. Everybody have to clear that up. Let me clear this up. Okay, let's take a look at this molecule. Take a look at this molecule. Let me put the charges on here. Let me put the charges on here. Let me put the charges on here. Let's charge there. Let's charge there. There is another resonance form here. There is another resonance form here. It's different than those other two I drew. It's different than those other two I drew. Okay? Remember, we can draw a resonance form. Remember, we can draw something like a lone pair, like a lone pair to a tie bond, a double tie bond. It's shifted around like we did here. Here's a lone pair here. Here's a lone pair here. And the other oxygen. You can draw. 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 You
example. The resonance form, the resonance form would look like this, like this. And now we have a negative charge, now we have a negative charge on the oxygen and a plus charge. If you calculate the formal charges, it would be on the nitrogen. It would be on the nitrogen. Okay? It's a resonance form. It's a resonance form. Uh, but uh, obviously, that's, obviously that's going to be somewhat higher in energy, higher in energy because what we've now done is separated out charge within the molecule as opposed to having all atoms neutral. All right? So, all right. so the hybrid in between, the hybrid between, in between is probably going to look left. more like the left yeah. right than the right. However, however, it's important to recognize, it's important to recognize that, that, that structure, that rest of the structure exists because when we talk about the electronic nature and the reactivity of formamides, that oxygen has some partially negative charge due to the donation from this nitrogen in the rest of its contribution. So that contribution is not zero. It's, um, it's um, significant in the fact that you have greater electron density here than you would here. When we really get into talking about reactions and, reactions and why molecules react the way they do, it's important to recognize the potential, um, the potential resonance structures that contribute to the overall structure. Okay. Okay. Any questions on resonance? When you go through the, when you go through the hopefully I think that assignment, uh, the homework assignment, should provide you with more opportunity to, to look at different resonance structures. You've been seeing me draw out molecules in a lot of different ways. As we continue to develop the language for organic chemistry, it's important to understand how to write organic structures. I just want to talk about some of the representations that we've been using and a few of the shortcuts that you've also seen me start to use. We know that we can draw out all atoms and draw all the electrons and dots around those atoms, which are shared, which are not shared. Um, and we call that the Lewis structure, the Lewis dot structure. If we cheat a little, if we cheat a little and, and make it easy by drawing uh, a single line to represent a shared pair of electrons, we refer to that as a tessellate structure. Um, we can draw out lone pairs or not. If I'm a little lazy about that. You should recognize, for example, in this 2-chloro, 2-methylpropane, that chlorine has three lone pairs on around it. Okay. So we represent shared bonds with covalent bonds. With covalent bonds. But that's also a little bit tedious. You have to draw out all those bonds to the hydrogens, and it makes it somewhat crowded around there, and it, 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 it doesn't allow us really to think about the carbon structure, the skeletal structure, and things like that. There are other ways to represent molecules, which you might have seen. One way is to use a condensed structure where we don't really draw the bonds, we just draw the atoms and assume that they're connected in a way which uh, goes from left to right. Okay. And where it's branched or where something is connected to one of the carbons, you uh, either put that in parentheses if it's um, a group which is uh, more than one atom, or you just have that atom follow it. So for example, in this condensed structure, or 2 chloroformethyl pentane, uh, notice we have a carbon here. This carbon, this carbon is connected to that carbon. That CH is connected to that CH. This group here, which is in parentheses, is a side chain off of that. So it's important to recognize that. Also, you notice that the chlorine here is connected to the carbon right before it. That's why there's only one hydrogen on that carbon. This carbon actually is connected to that carbon. So, uh, so be aware when you see condensed structures of those, uh, of those situations. Um, sometimes it's when you have larger structures, it's hard to see all that. And so I actually don't like to use condensed structures. Another way to do this, which is a little bit easier to see, is just to write a number of hydrogens that eventually bond to hydrogen, but still write the covalent bonds between the other atoms and carbon. So I refer to this as a condensed or technically structure in a way. Uh, you'll see me use that that method quite a bit uh, in, the, in the class. But the most easiest way, and I'm going to just do one last slide here, the easiest way to represent organic structures is in a skeletal line structure. This is a structure where we just leave off all the carbons and hydrogens that don't matter. In terms, we just assume, in this case, that at every point, every end, every end and 
every uh, connection, there is a carbon. And the rest of it on that carbon are hydrogens that are not written to make up the total of four bonds. So, for example, the carbon that's right here, we see three bonds. That fourth bond is to a hydrogen that's not written. Okay? And these skeletal structures show up in a lot of different molecules. And as you can see here, as the molecules get bigger and bigger, it's much easier to represent, view, and draw using these skeletal structures. Okay, and we'll talk more about structure drawing on Friday. I'm sorry, Wednesday. This is Monday. Oh, this is Wednesday. I'm getting confused now. Yeah, this is Wednesday. It was a short week. Uh, the online homework assignment will be available for you to do through the day next Wednesday. So take some time and look at that. Um, and uh, give me any feedback or problems you have.